Hey everyone, this is Pastor Brian Ross from Grace Life Bible Church in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And I'm going to come to you today with a video that I'm making responding to some questions that I've received regarding the debate and discussion that is occurring right now on uh, social media and so forth related to the subject matter of the judgment seat of Christ. Some people have uh, reached out to me and have, I've, I've made some Facebook posts loosely on some various matters of related to the conversation and discussion. My videos on the Judgment Seat of Christ that I did in 2014 have been uh, shared. Um, I made a playlist for those videos. I'll show you where you can uh, access that uh, later on. And then more recently yesterday, uh, a set of notes. I did a 22-part study in 2014 on the Judgment Seat of Christ and about nine of those studies, the notes have been put together and edited into a PDF related to the faithful saying in 2 Timothy chapter 2, <clears throat> excuse me, verses 11 through 13, and the issue of reigning with Christ. So there's 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 been my, my stuff about this has been shared. And let me just say at the beginning, I absolutely do not agree with the brethren who are saying that the judgment seat of Christ does not apply to the body of Christ and that it is for the little flock. I don't, I, I find their arguments um, uh, unpersuasive. I think there are serious uh, issues uh, um, and fallacies that are being used to make those arguments. And I've listened to about, I think, something like 18 hours worth of stuff related to this uh, from, uh, at least from one teacher, and a number of hours uh, from a second related to this subject matter. So I want to talk about in this video um, some questions that I got related to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. So there are two passages in Paul's epistles where the judgment seat of Christ is specifically mentioned. One of them is 2 Corinthians 5, the other one is Romans chapter 14. So some questions have come to me regarding uh, this particular passage. And the questions center around a couple things here, so I'll just lay them out briefly for you. Verse 1 says, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. And then if we come down here to verse 10, we see one of the mentions of the judgment seat of Christ. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every man may receive for the things done in his body, according that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. So this verse mentions we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And up here it says, for we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved. So from very early on in this discussion, um, many, many of us were saying, well, listen, we is plural and would include Paul. So if the judgment seat of Christ is um, only for the little flock, but Paul says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, including himself with his readers in that statement through the use of the word we, well, then is are these folks then saying Paul's a member of the little flock? Well, that question, in my as far as I can tell, after 18 hours of watching videos, has largely been dodged by saying, well, Paul was made all things to all men, and so therefore he's sort of loosely in a roundabout way included here. Um, in this we, but he's not necessarily himself going to be at the judgment seat of Christ because he wasn't a member of the little flock. He's the first member of the body of Christ. So listen, if you're going to accept that kind of argument, if you're going to accept that kind of reasoning, um, then it, 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 it's, it's sort of one of those things where then you're going to accept any anything because that is very weak arguments, very weak arg reasoning to say to say that when in clear definitive terms in both passages, let's in both passages where the judgment seat of Christ is specifically mentioned, it says we. So to get around Paul being included in the group that appears at the judgment seat of Christ by saying he became all things to all men is a dodge, and it doesn't really answer the question. So, but what is said, though, in this context, is this this context has to be made somehow to apply to the little flock and not the body of Christ, because it specifically mentions the judgment seat of Christ in verse 10. So what is done starts in verse 1, 
where it says, for we must, for we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle. So the first thing that's said is that tabernacle is a Jewish word. It's an Israelite word. And if you go back in and look at the first mention of this word and, you know, tabernacle is, is not something that applies to the body of Christ because it's a Jewish word. And I think it was uh, Brother Dave Reed pointed out, well, tabernacle means tent and Paul was a tent maker. So are we really going to say that, you know, a tent maker is not allowed to talk about tents or use them as illustrations in his teaching? All right. But then it, then it says, for we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved. And then a search is done on dissolved and it's found um, in the. So let's just do that. We'll just say D-O-S-L. We'll go with the asterisk here, and we will look for this, okay? So Blue Letter Bible will find for us that this is the first occurrence, dissolved. The earth and all the inhabitants thereof are dissolved. Um, I bear up the pillars of it. Salah. So the argument is, we'll see that dissolved is, is these things are, are, are being liquefied. They're being... Um, done away with, et cetera, is, is the idea. And so because this is in a context related to Israel and something that's going to happen in the future, in the ages to come, therefore, you know, when Paul uses the word dissolved in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, it's a Jewish word. And so the idea is that this is always and only a Jewish word, and it's referring to something being liquefied. It's referring to something being, you know, um, burnt, etc. Okay. So <clears throat> I have a couple of, of things I want to say about that. All right. First, before we even get to the issue of dissolve, let's go back into chapter four and we want to observe something. See, here's the thing. If you're going to say certain things about the Bible, they're going to impact other things about the Bible and, and, and they're going to have a cascade effect upon other things. So if we go to 2 Corinthians chapter four, I want you to notice something here, okay? In verse 7, Paul says, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels. So in chapter 4, he talks about earthen vessels. A few verses later in verse 11, he says that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So he talks about earthen vessels in verse 7. He talks about mortal flesh in verse 11. And then if you come down here further, he talks about the inward man and the outward man. Verse 16, for which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet our inward man is renewed day by day. So three times in the previous chapter, Paul is talking about and preparing and using imagery related to earthen vessels, related to our mortal flesh, related to our outward man that is that perish, but though our outward man perish. So the outward man is perishing. Paul says this, right? Um, and I'll just say, well, it says we here too. So whatever you're going to say about chapter 5, verse 1, about we, how would you not extend that or back that up three verses into verse 16 if you're going to be consistent in the application of the methodology that you are using to explain these verses, okay? Okay. But three times here in chapter four, Paul uses this imagery, earthen vessels, our mortal bodies, and our outward man, all right? So our body's mortal, our outward man's perishing, it says right there in the verse, right? And we have this treasure in earthen vessels. So then when you come here now to chapter five, verse one, notice how he's built, continuing to build on this idea. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, so here's a fourth one. It was earthen vessels. It was mortal bodies. It was outward man. Now it's house of this tabernacle. So here's the fourth type of language that Paul is using here to talk about our body, to talk about our mortal body or our mortal flesh, like he said there in the previous chapter. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved. Okay, so notice something here. It says, for we know that if. Now, those of us that believe in the Pauline revelation, we know that not every believer is going to die before the Lord returns in the air to catch away the church, the body of Christ, right? 
Paul explicitly says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Then we which are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep, etc. Right? So we know that not every member of the body of Christ is going to um, die before the Lord returns. Okay? But we also know, therefore, from that statement that many members of the body of Christ will die. Their outward man will perish. Their mortal flesh will breathe its last, okay? And they will die. So notice what this says. For we know that if, so he's already said a few, three verses up in chapter four about how our outward man is perishing. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, so notice the notice if, right? For we know that if it were dissolved, right? So there's a condition there. And I want to point something out here about this condition. So I'm going to come here to the inner linear. For we know, here's the King James text, if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved. So dissolved is the first verb after the word if. Dissolved is the first verb after the word if. Okay, so let's look into this, this verb. All right. Notice that this verb is in the subjunctive mood. So we have a condition followed by a verb dissolved in the subjunctive mood. So if we look there and we note it, we'll note that this is the mood of possibility and potentiality. Possibility and potentiality. The action described may or may not occur depending on the circumstances. So if the Lord returns to catch away the church, the body of Christ, some believers, the earthly house of this tabernacle of some believers is not going to dissolve because the Lord is going to catch them away to meet him in the air, right? But some believers, probably most throughout the history of the dispensation of grace, they are going to die. Their physical body, their mortal flesh, their outward man is going to perish and it's going to die, right? So we can see here very plainly that the first verb after the if is in the subjunctive, after the condition is in the subjunctive mood. Now, I can already hear people screaming about Greek and how we don't need to Greek things and this and that, okay? So let's come over to the OED and let's type in the word subjunctive and let's look at the word subjunctive. OK, and we need to see very plainly here as we do this, what we're talking about here. So here is subjunctive and notice the first definition. One a grammar designating or related to a verbal mood that refers to an action or state as conceived rather than as fact and is therefore used chiefly to express a wish, command, exhortation or a contingent hypothetical or perspective event. Okay, if we come down here, characteristic of what is expressed by the subjunctive mood, contingent, hypothetical. So when we come back now to 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, let's understand what this means. For we know that if the earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved. So if it's dissolved before the catching up, certain things, certain things are true. Okay, some of us, hopefully anyone listening to me right now, we will live to see the event in our body, our, our, our uh, outward man isn't going to perish, and our earthly house of this tabernacle is not going to be dissolved. But for some people, it will be. So let's go then look at the issue of dissolved. So remember that the whole argument for why this is applying to the little flock is based upon tabernacle and dissolved only being able to be used in reference to Jewish stuff, okay? Like the word dissolved or the word tabernacle can't be used by God the Holy Spirit to talk about anything other than, you know, the tabernacle, the Jewish tabernacle, or, you know, the dissolving of the elements by fervent heat, etc. Like that's the only meanings of these words. So let's look at the, the word dissolved here in the Oxford English Dictionary. And notice the first definition. To loosen or put asunder the parts of. To reduce to its formative elements. To destroy the physical integrity. To disintegrate, decompose. Okay? Let me ask you a question. 
the Apostle Paul's physical, the earthly house of Paul's physical body, the earthly house of his tabernacle, where is it today, right now, 2,000 years later? Has it disintegrated and decomposed? Um, yeah, a long time ago, right? Wycliffe, notice 1384, the Bible by Wycliffe, notice the reference, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. If our earthly house of this dwelling be dissolved, we had a building of God and house not made by hands everlasting. So contrary to what has been said about dissolved, here is a definition and a usage of the English word being dissolved to refer to something that is reduced to its formative elements, destroy, to destroy the physical integrity, to disintegrate, to decompose. Is this not exactly what happens to the body of a believer, to the earthly house of this tabernacle of a believer who dies before the rapture event? Okay? The way, they, the way pathologists and forensic scientists determine how long somebody's been dead is by how many maggot larvae have been laid in the corpse. This happens almost immediately after somebody dies physically. The process of dissolving in the sense of reducing to the formative elements, destroying the physical integrity, disintegrating, decompose, it starts happening almost immediately, right? And then if we go down, oh, to, here's a second definition, to melt or reduce into liquid condition. So when the scriptures talk about things being dissolved with fervent heat, here's a second meaning. So any method of Bible study that's going to tell you that words can only mean one thing because of the law of first mention and so on and so forth, you need to, you need, you need to think critically about whether or not that's true. Okay? Now, this issue of being dissolved, right? So why don't we look at dust? Let's do a search for dust. Um, see what we get. <clears throat> so we get Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So what is the fundamental base element that man is made out of in his physical structure? It's dust, right? It's dust. Genesis chapter 3, verse 19. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till, thy ret till thou return to the ground. For out of it wast thou taken from dust thou art, and from dust thou shalt return. Well, what does dissolve mean in its first definition? To loosen or to put us under the parts of, to reduce to its formative elements, to destroy the physical integrity, to disintegrate, to decompose, okay? When Paul is talking about the earthly house of this tabernacle being dissolved, he's talking about a believer who dies before the rapture event, before the catching up of the church. Their body, Paul's body, um, you know, all of them, the Ephesians body, the Colossians body, Titus's body, Philemon's body, they've all dissolved by the definition of what it means to dissolve. They were made, their bodies were made of dust. They have returned to dust. They've dissolved, right? Now notice this verse, for if, for we know that if the earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved. So if you're an atheist and your body dies, if you're an atheistic materialist and your body dies, that's it. You cease to exist. Okay. But that's not what this verse says. It says, for we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, so it's temporary, it's a tent, we have a building of God and house. So here's the contrast. The contrast is between the tabernacle, which is temporary, and the how, the building of God and house, which is permanent, and house not made with hands, eternal where? Eternal in the heavens. So if a believer dies before the catching up of the church, is he promised that he will have a, a building of God and house not made with hands eternal in the heavens? And I might add, if this verse is talking about the little flock, then is it not suggesting that the little flock is eternal in the heavens? 
do you see what happens when you have to when, when you redefine and reinterpret what things are meaning? You end up with a lot of interpretive problems, right? For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with heavens. Well, chapter four said that we have that we have this treasure in earth and vessels. It said that we have a mortal flesh. It said that our outward man perisheth. Now he says here in chapter five that this is temporary. And we know that if it dies, if subjunctive, if, if it's dissolved, if it returns back to its fundamental elements, if it decomposes, that we have a that we have a building and house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, in this what? In this earthly house of this tabernacle. In this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. If given the choice, would you want to stay here in this earthly house of this tabernacle, or would you want to have your, be clothed upon with, with, with your house, which is from heaven? I mean, it's a no-brainer, right? So when somebody says, well, dissolve doesn't apply to you, only the word changed applies to you who shall change our vile body, you need to question the integrity of that statement. Because that's not what this is saying. You have to make it say that so that you can say what you want in verse 10. Okay? For if we, for in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven, if so be that being clothed we should not be found naked. Okay, so what happens to a believer whose earthly house of this tabernacle is dissolved before the rapture event? Their body goes in the ground, and their soul and spirit go to be with the Lord. We'll see that a little bit further down, right? But they, in that state, they are waiting, they are still waiting for, they are still waiting for the rapture event, where the dead in Christ will rise first, okay? And they will receive that house, that eternal house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. So the idea of being found naked is the idea of being without being being without a body, your soul and spirit not having a not having a a a, a tabernacle or a or a house to dwell in because they are in the state of being found naked before the rapture event. And then he says, for we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed. I mean, would you, does anybody want to, as a believer, what is your preference? Your preference is not to die and wait for the resurrection, the redemption, to it, the redemption of your body, the adoption to it, the redemption of your body. Your preference, your preference is to, to see the event, right? To, to live through the, to be alive when that occurs. We would, to be in the category of we which are alive and remain. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan being burdened, not for that we would be clothed, not for that, sorry, we would be unclothed. So that's, that's found in that, in that state of your body having been dissolved, but still waiting for that house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. Not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Okay? Now he that hath wrought us, now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given us the earnest of the Spirit. So, how is it that the believer whose earthly house of this tabernacle is dissolved before the catching up of the church, how can they have confidence, how can they know that if the earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and a house not made with hands, eternal heavens? How can they know that? Because they've been given the earnest of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is given to the believer, seals them unto the day of redemption, is the earnest of the purchased possession, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1. And so therefore we know this. We have, we have a spiritual understanding and an awareness of the truth of what Paul is saying in this chapter because we have the earnest of the Spirit. 
And then notice how this plays out. Therefore, we are always confident. Our confidence is coming because we have the earnest of the Spirit. And because we have the earnest of the Spirit, we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a, a house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. The future destiny of the body of Christ is in the heavens. If this passage is talking about the little flock, then the little flock has a heavenly destiny. For we, uh, for we are always confident, knowing... I'm um, sorry. Now we... Now he that has... I read that. Sorry. Verse 6. Therefore... We are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. So as long as I am in the earthly house of this tabernacle, as long as my soul and spirit, as long as my inner man, which he also talked about at the end of verse, at the end of chapter four, right? In verse um, 16, for, for which cause we faint not, though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day, right? So we're confident knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. So as long as we're in the body, so what is the imagery Paul's used for the body? He's called the body, the earthly house of this tabernacle. He's called the body, the outward man. He's called the body, the mortal flesh, and he's called the body, an earthen vessel. So as long as I'm home in my body, as long as I am dwelling in this temporary tent, this tabernacle, as long as I'm dwelling here, I'm absent from the Lord because I'm here in this tabernacle. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. So when my body, if I die before the event of the catching away of the church, if I die before that event, if I, when I depart the earthly house of this tabernacle, when I lay this temporary tent aside, and my soul and spirit, they go where? They go to be with the Lord. I'm present with the Lord. As long as I'm here in this body, I'm absent from the Lord. This is totally talking about the body of Christ, folks. This is not talking about the little flock. Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. Now, this has turned into a, a, a big thing about, you know, um, the difference between standing and state or position. And people are told, well, if that doesn't, if that doesn't resonate, resonate with your heart, then it's not true. Folks, you need to be extremely leery of that kind of reasoning. That is the reasoning of the Pentecostal charismatic movement that bases truth on feelings and how verses speak to your heart or don't speak to your heart. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive for the things done in his body. So it's clear again that the, that the earthly house of this tabernacle is your body, <clears throat> that everyone may receive for the things done in his body according that he had done, whether it be good or bad, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. Now, I want to say something about this verse. That, ver that phrase, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, that is, Paul knew the terror of the Lord. Paul knew what it was like on the road to Damascus in Acts 9 to see the Lord in the road, and he fell on his face and he was blinded. He knows what it's like to be in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. And every person in the Bible that has ever come into contact with God or an angel or something, they fell on their face because of the presence of God. He's saying, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. He's not saying that you need to be freaked out, that you, that you need to be scared or what have you, he's saying, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. He's saying, we, I know what it's like, so I'm going to try to persuade men on this point. But we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also made manifest in your consciences. Now, there's a lot more we could say about verses 5, uh, 5, 10, and 11, and um, I would encourage you to consider the series of studies that I did on the judgment seat of Christ. It's not my intention with this video to expound on those verses specifically, but here's what I want to go to, okay? Now look at starting at verse 12. For we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf, 
that ye may have somewhat to answer them, which glory in appearance and not in heart. For whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God, or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. So here's my first question, okay? Where, notice, we, 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 if this is all talking about, if verses 1 through 10 are talking about the little flock, then verse 12, 13, and 14 also have to be talking about the little flock. You cannot jump into this passage and say that Paul magically changes now who he's talking to. And listen, this is going to have serious implications and cascade over a whole bunch of other things here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Look at verse 15. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore know we? Hmm. I seem to recall one of the major teachers of this new view referring to this verse not long ago in a message and applying it to the body of Christ. But if you take the methodology and the logic that is articulated in um, the main enunciations of this view, this we would also have to be referring to the little flock. And if it's not, if somebody's going to say it's not, then they have to show us based upon clear teaching and interpretive principles how, why this we is different from the we in verse 1 and from the we in verse 10. This is my point. You cannot, there's a fallacy, a logical fallacy called the taxi cab fallacy. And the taxi cab fallacy says that you cannot get into a taxi cab, ride it for a while, get out, and then get back in and keep going. So you would get out at a point where it's no longer convenient for you to be in the taxi cab, only to get back in and to keep riding it. Okay. If you're going to say certain things, you have to consistently apply them through the whole passage. And if that's true, folks, this puts in jeopardy whether the body of Christ is a new creature. Now, I know that the articulators of this new view are going to say that's not what we're saying. But logical interpretational principles would mandate that they have to say this unless they can show us a reasonable articulation, a reasonable principle of study that would say otherwise. Henceforth, no, we know man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Well, whoever is a new creature here are the same people here who don't know Christ after the flesh. And if the we, it says we here, it says we here, and if the we is the little flock, then this doesn't apply to the little flock in the body. Of, this, this applies to the little flock in the body of Christ is not a new creature. Let's keep going. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Behold, all things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to Himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given unto us the ministry of uh, the ministry of reconciliation, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the word unto Himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. See, is that the is that not the body of Christ? When did it change? And based upon what rules of interpretation should we accept the fact that there has been a change if the articulators of this view want us to buy that? And they're going to say, well, we never said that. We never said that that's what it says. No, I understand that. I understand that you haven't said that. I'm pointing out to people who are listening the logical implications of what you have said. You've got to ride the taxi all the way to the end. You can't get out at verse 10 and decide that the rest of it is all of a sudden somehow different. That's not the way it works. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. So if the we is the little flock here, and if that's who this is in verse 1, and if that's who this is in verse 10 that stands at the judgment seat of Christ, then that's who's a new creature, the little flock, and then that's who's ambassadors for Christ, the little flock, not the body of Christ, and 
Shock of all shocks. Look at verse 21. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we, uh-oh, got to be the little flock, right? That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. In fact, I heard this verse quoted this past Sunday on the 17th of January, 2021, is in reference to the church, the body of Christ. But it says we. So by what principle of interpretation can this end up? You cannot make the first 10 verses the little flock and not make all of the chapter the little flock. And if you make all of the chapter the little flock, then the body of Christ is not a new creature. The body of Christ are not ambassadors for Christ. And the body of Christ, you're putting the idea of the body of Christ being made the righteous of God and him in jeopardy because it still says we. So, folks, my point is you have to take a position. If you're going to get in that taxi cab, you got to ride that taxi cab all the way to the end. And let me show you one more thing here. Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. We've heard a lot of stuff about Timothy being a member of the little flock. We've heard that um, uh, blue pencils have been purchased from Michael's and that somebody is going through uh, first and second Timothy and in blue noting all of the verses that are our little flock verses 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 for the uh, church the body of Christ right and when all this started back in November it started around these three verses right here these four verses right here in second Timothy chapter 2 starting in verse 10 therefore I endure all things for the elect sakes that I may obtain salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory it is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. So what's said about that is that these verses are to, that Timothy is a little flocker, and that these verses are to and about the little flock. What verse is two verses later? Verse 15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So what changed between verse 13 and 14, between verses 13 and 15? If 10, 11, 12, and 13 are Paul writing to a little flocker about the little flock, then why is 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15 to the body of Christ, and why do I now have to endeavor to study to show myself approved unto God? See, you can't, you, you got to ride the taxi cab to the end. What changed in between verse 13 and verse 15 to suggest now that this still applies to somebody who is not in the little flock? It doesn't make any sense, folks. It doesn't make any sense. So I'm going to have a few more things to say about a few of those points. But let me just show you a couple things. On the Grace Life Bible Church YouTube page, we have created a playlist, if it will load. On the Grace Life Bible Church YouTube page, we have created a playlist for the Judgment Seat of Christ. So if you look us up on YouTube and click on Playlists, you'll see that there is a 23-part playlist here on the, the subject of the judgment seat of Christ is a serious subject in Paul's epistle. On the issue of the judgment seat of Christ. It deals with, in more detail, the, the main part, uh, Pauline text in Romans chapter uh, 14 and 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It talks about the terror of the Lord. It talks about all of that, uh, some things that I just sort of went through very quickly here. So um, here's where you can get this. I will put a link to this playlist uh, in this video. And then also, I will also share a link to the edited notes that were put together here recently on um, what it means to reign with Christ and this faithful saying here in 2 Timothy. Um, in 2 Timothy. So, folks, I think that this new teaching has serious problems. I think there are major logical errors. Listen, nobody cares if there's 51 inches on a drywall square of occurrences of fire and a quarter of an inch of them are in Paul's epistles, what does that have to do with the price of tea in China? 
Okay, that's that's the kind of stuff that we're dealing with here. And all we've seen are appeals to emotion, the reading of testimonials, appeals to authority. I've studied my Bible for eight hours a day and forty five hours a week, and 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 um, all sorts of cr- weird arguments that are just made up as things are going along. So I understand that I've been direct. I understand that I have been um, very pointed in my comments. But I want you to see that I have focused my attention not on the men, not on the people, but on the things that are being said to try to justify this new, this so-called new view. There are fallacies of logic. There are all sorts of issues with, you know, now we're told here recently that we have to know about oriental manners and Bible customs to understand our Bible from the same folks who say that you don't need any other books to understand your Bible, and all you need is to know the built-in dictionary. So there's a lot of things that are said in all of this that don't make any sense that I want to warn folks about. And I hope that you'll listen and take this seriously. If if you don't like what I'm saying and you want to dismiss what I'm saying, you know, that's certainly your prerogative. But I think it is, I think it is absolutely the wrong thing to say to people who are in a body of flesh until the day of redemption that there's no accountability for their actions. There's no there's that there is no judgment seat of Christ and that there is no accountability for um, what we do. I understand that I'm totally forgiven. I understand that I have the righteousness of God imputed to my account. I understand who I am in Christ, that I'm blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. I understand all of that. But I also understand that I have a reasonable service to perform, for that I have a reasonable service unto Christ Jesus, my Savior, as a member of the church, the body of Christ. So hopefully you'll give this some thought. Thanks for listening.